organized crime tore through the suburbs of Chicago, leaving violence and corruption in its wake. Prominent officials were seduced by greed and power, doing whatever was necessary to protect their interests. Everyone was on the take. It would fall on the FBI to weed out the corruption and to find the killer of an innocent woman. The bank of a sanitary canal in a remote industrial area became the site of a gruesome crime. The killers were quick and thorough. Nearby, two police officers were out on night patrol. When they heard the shots fired, they became alarmed. One of the officers drove towards the canal to investigate. He found nothing as he searched the desolate area. Hey, Chief. Also on the scene was Willow Springs, Illinois, Police Chief Michael Corbett. I heard it earlier myself, and I've already checked the area, so... He, too, saw nothing. I got a cup. Do you want it? The following day, a prominent local attorney called police to report that his wife was missing. Well, Mr. Masters, we'd like to ask a few questions about your wife. Lieutenant well, Howard Vanek anyway, of the Cook County Sheriff's Department and his partner well, we responded to the Thank call. You. Attorney Alan Masters said that his wife Diane had been out the night before with colleagues and friends from a local college where she worked. She never came home. There was no sign of her yellow Cadillac. He said he made calls trying to locate her until two in the morning, but finally gave up. For the officers, the information offered little insight. Excuse me a minute. Lieutenant James Keating of the Cook County Sheriff's Department joined the officers. Yeah, Sir, sure, we were just asking Mr. Masters questions about his wife's disappearance. He asked Masters, Masters if he could have a look around the house. Sure. Yeah, Masters my, agreed. My, no, he had nothing to hide. The officers continued their questioning. Anything else you can tell us? As far as I, as far Reluctantly, as I know, Masters uh, offered some new information. Somebody, somebody works for the college. He suspected that his wife Diane had been having an affair. Maybe the two lovers had run off together. I don't know who he is or what he looks like. I just have my suspicions. Excuse me, guys. I think we need to wrap this up. Lieutenant Vanek wanted to investigate further and look around the house himself. Sir, I think we need to take another look around in here. Husbands are always suspects when their wives I'm disappear. There's nothing, nothing. Sir, here. we need to look around. It's time to Something's go. Missing her, Let's sir. go now. But Lieutenant Keating intervened. He sir, wouldn't allow it. Two investigators always check out the scene. In his mind, everything had checked out. Now. Let's sir. go now. Vanek was upset. He didn't know why Keating would undermine his investigation. Outside, Keating confronted Lieutenant Vanek, telling him to back off. As far as he was concerned, Masters was not a suspect. But Vanek didn't buy it, and he let Keating know. Just as the two men were about to explode, Willow Springs Police Chief Michael Corbett arrived at the scene. Keating would have the final word. Vanek, you're off the case. 
Forget it. You're off the case, man. You got that? The question still remained, where was Diane Masters? Her disappearance grabbed the media's attention. And Diane, if you would, please come together. She had been very active in the local community. Diane had worked hard to help open a shelter for battered women. She was also involved in local politics and sat on the board of the Moraine Valley Community also College. Like to Diane with his plaque. She did not appear to have any enemies. Hard work and her dedication in opening this crisis center, something that is needed desperately in this community. But investigators began uncovering other details. It was reported by Diane's friends that her husband was controlling and abusive, and that Diane was planning to file for divorce. Assistant U.S. Attorney Tom Scorza followed the case. We were pretty certain that what had happened here was that Diane and Alan in a regular, had a regular marital dispute, sort of ordinary dispute, but that it had escalated uh, into something much worse. Go ahead and send them in. Scorza's investigation soon revealed that Alan Masters was more than just a bad husband. Hey, Al, how you doing? It was rumored that Alan Masters had bribed local officials and police officers to secure favorable outcomes for his clients. How'd it go? Very well, very well. Nothing to worry this about corruption extended Nobody. right to the top of law enforcement. Allegedly, Masters frequently enlisted the help of Chief Corbett. It was also rumored that Masters and Chief Corbett were involved in safeguarding some of the Chicago mob's betting and prostitution rings, which were run out of show clubs throughout suburban Cook County. But investigators were focused only on Diane's disappearance. With no evidence and few leads, that investigation stalled. Unaware of Alan Masters or his wife's disappearance, the FBI had already begun an independent investigation into the mob-controlled rackets of the Chicago area. U.S. Attorney David Stetler worked with the FBI to help unravel the prostitution operation. At that time, there were a number of topless, bottomless joints that one could go to, and many of them were undercover fronts for prostitution. So you could go in, uh, you could watch the naked girls dancing on the stage, and for a price, you could retreat to the back, either to a booth or a back room, and engage in one form of sexual activity or another with the dancers. The club owners knew that their customers would spend more on drinks and prostitutes if they could use their credit cards. But the patrons were reluctant. They did not want bills arriving at their homes or businesses with charges incurred from nightclubs with CD names. The club owners found credit card transaction companies that were willing to process the charges using false but respectable business names. Special Agent Ivan Harris of the FBI's Chicago field office was assigned to help bring down the illegal businesses. The scam uh, was using various companies in order to launder credit cards uh, through their business to make it appear that uh, businessmen were actually uh, eating at a restaurant or using a limousine service uh, to incur the charges when in fact uh, they were charges for prostitution. Larry Wright was one of the credit card transaction company owners. Wright would pick up the week's transactions from the clubs and process them through his company, National Credit Service, or NCS. One of his clients was a club owner named Joseph Marin, whose club was a front for a mob-controlled prostitution house. Wright wanted to expand his own operations. He approached Marin about setting up an illegal betting club. 
Marin was willing to help out the man who made him money. Wright would first need to pay protection money to local police in order not to be exposed and arrested. Marin was the man who could arrange that protection. Wright was more than willing to pay. Marin arranged the meeting at the Willow Springs Police Department. It was to take place with Police Chief Michael Corbett. It was believed that Corbett had been handpicked by the Chicago mob boss to oversee and protect their interests in and around Willow Springs. The word on the street, of course, was that no one could do anything in Willow Springs without the permission of uh, the chief of police, Mike Corbett. The message also was from virtually anyone you would talk to that he was so powerful, that he was so well connected, that nothing could ever be done about him. I just want to make sure I don't get any unexpected visits. Corbett agreed to help Larry Wright set up the new betting operation for a price. Not quite yet. In return, Corbett assured him he wouldn't get any heat from his officers. Larry Wright was well on his way. He returned to his office at National Credit Service, operated out of a nondescript office park location. Wright worked with two other staff members. Doing great, Larry. Great. But these were not ordinary employees. NCS was not just a credit card transaction service for illegal activities. It was a front for the FBI. Larry Wright was actually undercover special agent Larry Damron. And he and the FBI were using NCS to work their way into the heart of the corruption in Willow Springs. While local investigators struggled to unravel the disappearance of a prominent attorney's wife, the FBI had set up an undercover operation in the town of Willow Springs, just outside of Chicago. Their target, organized crime, and the corrupt police who protected them from prosecution. The undercover work was often painstaking and frustrating. FBI Special Agent Larry Damron explains the difficulties inherent in undercover work. During the course of the undercover operation, you try to immerse yourself in what you're doing and you, and you try to assume that role because it's necessary for you to do that in order to uh, accomplish anything. Oftentimes you'll hear people make comments or you'll see people do things that uh, in any other circumstance they would be arrested for immediately. And so what you have to remember is you're in a role and you play that role out. Dameron had heard stories about how the mob resolved problems. They were swift and violent, and their signature was unmistakable. Two bullets in the head. There was no room for mistakes. Victor Spilatro, a player in Chicago's organized crime, approached Damron at NCS. Though Victor himself wielded little power, his brothers held tremendous influence within the mob's hierarchy. Damron was starting to move into the center of the violent Chicago underworld. The Spilatros were one of the best known names uh, of mobsters in Chicago. Uh, the uh, older brother, uh, Tony was the boss in Las Vegas. He represented the Chicago outfit uh, for their interest in Las Vegas. Um, had been a prominent figure and had been uh, widely uh, uh, mentioned in the papers having been involved in murders and extortions and things like that. Agent Damron quickly developed a reputation as an effective businessman in laundering money for mob operations. Sure, everything's all right. Spilatro knew of NCS's activities with the local nightclubs. They were under his control. I really appreciate what you're doing. Good, everything's going good with the business? Yes, it's going great. That's great. He told Damron he would have to pay him a cut to stay in business. I'm glad you appreciate it. 
appreciate what we do for you. Okay, well, that's really good. Damron had no objection. The level that we had there is we were paying protection to a fairly important uh, aspect of the mob, the Spilatro family. And so that gave us a little bit of uh, uh, status, if you will. But we had absolutely no authority or anything like that in the mob. We were just workers, and our value was we made them money. Agent Damron traveled to a remote hotel where he met with FBI Special Agent Gordon Brooks, hey, who oversaw the undercover operation. To ensure that Damron's real identity was not compromised, the two met infrequently to exchange information. Brooks vigilantly kept tabs on Damron. The investigation was as dangerous as it was complex. The agent cautiously moved forward. He wanted to continue expanding the FBI's undercover operations. He used every opportunity he could to sell the idea of opening more betting and prostitution houses throughout suburban Chicago. Even with a go-ahead from the Spilatros, Damron would still need permission and protection from the police. He met with nightclub owner Joseph Marin to hash out the details of the new clubs and secure police protection. But there was a problem. I got some upsetting What's up? Their protector, Chief Corbett, had been removed by the Willow Spring City Council under suspicion of corruption. Marin knew another high-ranking law enforcement official who could provide the same protection as Corbett, Lieutenant James Keating. Cook County's Vice Squad Supervisor. I'll tell you what, you know, he deals with me. U.S. Attorney Tom Scorza was not surprised by the development. Keating's reputation was well known. Okay, you, feel, you feel pretty confident yeah. about this guy? Yeah. Jim Keating was a, a lieutenant in the uh, Cook County Sheriff's Police Department, but if anything, the rank understated his influence. He was a very well connected uh, officer in a very corrupt department. Uh, he had connections with people of higher rank who were also corrupt, and so he was a key figure. With Corbett out of the picture, the FBI shifted their focus to Keating. Damron met with him at a restaurant outside of Willow Springs. Keating said he'd have no problem helping Damron expand his operations. One thing we need to understand is if there's a situation that comes up... But any move Damron made would have to be approved by him. He warned Damron to play it straight with him and his people. He told us that the one thing that he wouldn't tolerate was if someone double-crossed him. And he said if, uh, if that happened, that we'd, they'd find us with our legs on one of the streets in the area and our head on another street in the area. As instructed by the FBI, Damron proposed another operation, a club that would be a front for prostitution. He gave the lieutenant the first of many payments to ensure police protection. Looks like a bonus for the guys. Before he left, Keating said he knew someone who might be able to help him, a lawyer named Alan Masters. Though he had no direct dealings with Alan Masters, Damron had heard the name mentioned by Chief Corbett. Well, I knew that Masters was a well-known attorney on the uh, south side of uh, Chicago, that he had a tremendous reputation for being able to uh, get things done, particularly in the, in the local court system. And the, uh, uh, the scuttlebutt was that, that he wasn't reluctant to pay bribes or to deal with people however he needed to. Damron continued his meetings with his case supervisor, Special Agent Gordon Brooks. Damron needed to know everything he could about Alan Masters and his relationship with Keating and Corbett. The FBI and U.S. attorneys quickly established a hierarchy within this ring of corruption. Corbett was the king in Willow Springs, but any time he had to do something that involved the broader Cook County, he needed to get the permission of Keating. And Keating always had to check with the ultimate fixer, Alan Masters, to make sure everything could be handled at the court level. Maybe get Masters interested. 
As the extent of Alan Masters' criminal activity became clearer, the FBI began looking closer at his possible role in his wife's disappearance. The two distinct cases were beginning to overlap, and Damron's objectives were broadening. He was a suspect in the disappearance of his wife. Uh, it was thought that if we could develop a relationship with him, there might be something there uh, that would come, come to light and, uh, and might be of some benefit to that investigation. Damron learned that Alan Masters allegedly made payoffs to several area judges in exchange for favorable decisions. Now, we need to have that hearing on the Sanderson case. It needs to go our way. Do we have an understanding on that, Judge? Agents speculated that Diane might have witnessed her husband's illegal activity and threatened to expose him. Now trying to elicit information about Diane's disappearance, Damron continued his efforts to make inroads into the corruption around Willow Springs. He met with Keating several weeks later to follow up on his plan to open a show club. Again, Keating mentioned that his friend Alan Masters could help. Damron took the opportunity to bring up Alan's wife. Keating said little but then added an unusual comment. We talked uh, about Master's wife uh, turning up missing, and Keating said, well, she turned up missing like the day before the divorce was going to be filed. That was convenient, wasn't it? It was convenient. And chuckled about what a, what a good circumstance that was. Damron was cautious not to probe too far, fearing that Keating might grow suspicious. You've known this fellow for a long time? Yeah, known he, him for a while. He, I've worked he, with him before. Sure, he can do. Just As the meeting ended, Keating handed over Alan Masters' phone number, saying the lawyer was expecting his you call. Be he proceeded to set up the meeting with Alan Masters. Hello? Mr. Masters, how are you? This is Larry Wright speaking. The attorney agreed to help push through all the necessary permits and legal documents, which meant bribing officials and securing protection. Yeah, we've been working uh, pretty hard on it for a while now. Well, so I think it'd be Masters good suggested location. they get together. About, uh... The meeting was set for the following week, Monday, December 13th. Okay, I'll, I'll look forward to meeting you then. Uh, I think we can maybe do some business. Okay, thanks. Bye. Before the meeting would take place, however, a police officer on routine patrol near the Sanitary Canal area in Willow Springs noticed something unusual. Tire tracks led directly into the canal. He immediately called for assistance. Little did he know that the lid was about to come off the underworld in Willow Springs. Find these trucks out here and mark while the FBI continued their undercover operation in the Chicago suburb of Willow Springs, an officer out on routine patrol made an alarming discovery. Tire tracks leading directly into the sanitary canal. Police officers and a dive team responded to the site. Overseeing the investigation was James Ross, an honest cop appointed by city council to replace Michael Corbett as the police chief in Willow Springs. Though Corbett had been ousted from the department, his legacy of corruption remained. Below the surface, divers found a virtual underwater parking lot. 82 cars lined the bottom of the polluted canal. U.S. Attorney Tom Scorza believed he knew why the cars were there and who could make a profit by allowing them to be dumped without a police investigation. Those are known as uh, insurance give-ups, uh, people who want to collect money on their car when the car is not worth very much anymore will find a way of uh, losing the car and then reporting it stolen and collect the insurance. Uh, my belief was that Corbett had been uh, the approver of all of the dumping of the cars in the Willow Springs Canal. 
By nighttime, a third car had been dredged up, a yellow Cadillac. The license plate on the vehicle DGM-19 was well known in Willow Springs. It was the tag registered to Diane Masters. Lieutenant Keating of the Cook County Sheriff's Department arrived at the scene. Chief Ross was surprised that Keating, a vice cop, had been notified. He asked Keating why he was there. Keating had no response. Officers continued examining the Cadillac. When they pried open the trunk, they discovered a decomposed body. Ross immediately ordered that the car and the body be taken back to a city garage where they could be thoroughly examined for clues. The decision not to use the police garage was well reasoned. Chief Ross knew this case potentially had far-reaching implications, and he couldn't trust his own officers. The fewer people nosing around, the better. State police began to scour the car and the body for evidence. They found 22 caliber shell casings in the trunk. The keys were still in the ignition. Eerily, the watch on the deceased body and the dashboard clock had stopped at exactly the same time, 1.50. They removed the body for further forensic investigation. The forensic team examining the body found the skull had been crushed. They also discovered two bullet hole entries in the left cheekbone. The bullet fragments inside the skull were removed and sent off to the FBI lab for ballistic evaluation. Dental records confirmed what everyone believed. The body found in the trunk was Diane Masters. The nine-month investigation into Diane's disappearance was now a homicide investigation. Come on in. Chief Ross called in Cook County Detective John Reed to work the homicide. He was to team up with the FBI, who was now taking over the murder investigation. Detective Reed was not to trust even his closest friends in the department. He was told that through the FBI undercover operation run out of NCS, law enforcement officers were being investigated for corruption. And some had ties to Alan Masters, who was now a firm suspect in Diane's murder. As Agent Harris and Detective Reed initiated their murder investigation, Agent Damron continued his undercover operation. Today, to set up a time and place for our meeting. He called uh, Alan Masters to confirm their meeting to set up the show club. Masters was evasive and seemed distracted. Maybe we can work something out then. Just, you know, give me some time. He canceled the meeting. Okay, thanks, Mr. Damron immediately called Keating. With the conversation being Keating. recorded by the FBI, he hoped Keating would explain why Masters was being evasive. No, I was wondering if you had any information on that. As I said, he's uh, pretty busy. Uh, how about if you give me a call in three or four weeks? But Keating was cryptic. Maybe we can work something out then. He instructed Damron not to bother Masters. He had too many problems to deal with. Okay. The new show club would have to wait. What do you got for me? Here, here the Damron met with Agent Brooks. Masters and Keating both appeared nervous since Diane's body had been discovered. But that was hardly enough evidence to prosecute either of them for murder. Really 
Perhaps Damron had overlooked something. He handed over his tape-recorded conversations with Keating. Matt, this is gonna nail him. We're gonna get him. Can you play that again, please? Mm -hmm. Over the next several months, the U.S. Attorney's Office, the Cook County Sheriff's Department, and the FBI began the process of merging the various investigations. All right. Well. The link between them was Alan Masters, Cook County Lieutenant James Keating, and former Willow Springs Police Chief Michael Corbett. If that's the case, if we can put... It would fall on prosecutors to begin constructing a case proving that the three men and all of their activities represented an ongoing, organized criminal enterprise. And what we had to do in order to prosecute Masters and Corbett and Keating for a collection of their activities, including the homicide, we had to show that they made up a criminal organization, a mini mafia. Appreciate you meeting with us tonight, Mrs. Capstaff. Uh, well, if you guys. Detective Reed and Agent Harris's first step was to question Diane's friends who had been with her on the night she disappeared. Okay. You said that you uh, followed her home that night. One of Diane's colleagues, Genevieve Capstaff, had actually followed Diane home that evening after a board meeting. And so I just wanted to see, so I followed her. Capstaff claimed everyone on the Moraine Community College Board who worked with Diane suspected that she was having an affair with an economics professor. She admitted that she wanted to see if the two were going to rendezvous. She followed Diane to her street. When Diane turned to go home, Capstaff continued on. Is there anything else that you can tell? Further questioning revealed that all of the community college board members, including Diane, were given a $100,000 life insurance policy as part of their employment benefits. The policy specifically stated that proceeds would be paid if a board member died while traveling to and from board meetings. The policy was void when the board member entered their home. Alan Masters claimed Diane never arrived home that night. He was therefore eligible to collect the insurance money. Several months before Diane's body was discovered in the trunk of her car, Masters filed a claim with the insurance company. After filling out all the paperwork, he sent it off. Though Diane's fate at that time was unclear, Masters had a judge declare her legally dead. As a result, he was about to receive $100,000. Alan Masters was fast becoming the FBI's prime suspect in the murder of his wife, Diane. Shortly after her body was discovered, investigators learned that he had filed a claim with his wife's insurance company. Within a few months, two checks appeared in the amount of $50,000 each. If federal agents and prosecutors could prove Masters was responsible for his wife's death and that he profited from it, it would be one more element that showed that he and his accomplices were involved in an ongoing criminal enterprise. Homicide in a federal racketeering case carries much more jail time than a state charge. As the investigation began to take on a clearer focus, FBI agents working the undercover case received bad news. Listen, we're gonna have to move rather quickly on. The Washington Post had gotten word of the operation. We're almost at the point where we can really make some impact. The, the Post gave the FBI three weeks to wrap it up before running the story. Agents had no choice but to quickly bring their undercover operations to a close. For U.S. Attorney David Stetler, the timing couldn't have been better. The project had run its course, and the bulk of the information anybody was ever going to get had been retrieved. And to make the operation go on, go on longer would have resulted in additional evidence, but it also would have resulted in the evidence that had been gathered becoming more and more stale. Oh. 
Agents had meticulously pieced together the web of corruption that extended to the nightclubs under mob control. Now it was time to shut them down. The FBI hit all of the clubs on the same night with massive force. Several hundred officers and agents raided over a dozen clubs throughout Cook County, including those in Willow Springs. Stay right here. Go on in, Stay right here. Sit tight. Right, hands behind your back. Inside the clubs, federal agents were able to collect volumes of incriminating evidence. Fifty-five people were indicted, including club owner Joseph Marin, Tony Spilatro, and his brother Victor. They were prosecuted in both the state and federal courts for extortion, prostitution, bribery, and racketeering. Several deputies from the Cook County Sheriff's Department and officers from the Willow Springs Police Department were also indicted and convicted for protecting these businesses. After three years of undercover work, the sting operation was now officially closed. For undercover Special Agent Larry Damron, it was finally time to leave the role of Larry Wright. I would say the finish was elation and disappointment at the same time. Disappointment that uh, there were so many opportunities out there to, to identify other criminal activity. We knew that, uh, that it was a good job, that we had gathered tremendous amounts of evidence, and that we had a, a real insight into uh, some of the criminal activity that was taking place that we hadn't had before. Alan Masters Local authorities, the FBI, and prosecutors could now focus exclusively on the Diane Masters murder investigation. They continued questioning her friends and associates, including the man with whom she was allegedly having an affair. Economics professor Jim Koselniak. He confirmed that he and Diane had a relationship. He also claimed that Masters had abused Diane physically, mentally, and emotionally. She lived in fear of her husband. Diane had told him she planned to file for divorce. Kaselniak also had reason to fear Alan Masters. One night, Kaselniak and Diane had met for drinks at a local bar. He recalled that Diane called home to check on her daughter. Instead of getting the babysitter on the phone, Alan unexpectedly answered. Alan? He suspected she was with her lover. Um, I didn't know you were he was involved. irate and began to threaten her. I was calling her. to check on Andrew. He vowed to destroy her. Kuselniak said Diane returned from the phone call and was very upset. He went to the bar for more drinks. There, a man suddenly confronted him and began firing off a series of questions. Yes, I did. The man never identified himself. He asked Kuselniak's name and where he worked. Though the man said little else, Kuselniak felt he had just received a threat. Stay away from Diane. And Kuselniak would later recognize the man as Lieutenant James Keating. He said that on the night of Diane's disappearance, she had called him and warned him not to meet her for drinks. So this was an unusual move on her part. They usually got together after her college board meetings. Lately, she had been troubled by Alan's behavior. Miselniak took her advice and canceled their plans. He never saw Diane again. Of fact, 
on the way now. Agent Harris and Detective Reed continued to develop witnesses. They discovered that Masters had hired a private investigator to keep tabs on Diane. We subsequently developed a cooperating individual named Ted Nakaza, who was a private investigator with uh, Alan Masters. Uh, Masters had requested Ted Nakaza to place a bug on his home telephone number because he suspected his wife, Diane, uh, was having an affair. I got a few tapes. Hey, what do you guys got for me? Nikaza told investigators the bug was successful in exposing Diane and Koselniak's affair. Ted Nikaza played back a telephone conversation captured on tape where Diane was talking in a highly sexual way with the boyfriend, Jim Koselniak. Um, according to Nikaza, after playing the tape, Alan Masters declared his intention to kill Diane and to get Keating to make it look like an accident. Alan Masters wanted his here. wife murdered, and he had the resources to get away with it. We have to stay cool the FBI and local authorities FBI continued to uncover evidence against Alan Masters and his associates that pointed towards a conspiracy to murder Alan's wife, Diane. Through a private investigator hired by Alan Masters, Diane's affair had been exposed. Alan's rage was out of control. But investigators had no hard evidence to charge him with murder. After an exhaustive five-year investigation, that was about to change. He intended to have Diane killed. They uncovered a Cook County Sheriff's deputy who was willing to talk. Deputy Jack Bachman had startling information. Bachman had been too afraid of the consequences of coming forward on his own. He claimed that he had been approached to kill Diane. The offer had come through Lieutenant James Keating. Bachman had a series of conversations with Keating, and ultimately Keating asked Bachman if Bachman would be interested in the job of actually stalking and killing Diane Masters. Bachman said Keating offered him $25,000 to carry out the hit. And Michael Corbett, the chief of police, had already agreed to dispose of the body. Bachman declined the offer. No, sir, I'm sorry, I can't get involved in anything like that. No, no sir. Through Keating, Masters had clearly uh, solicited a murder. Up this, this meeting we just had in, uh, what well, no, but he did offer me This was one of the final pieces Prosecutor Scorza needed oh. to bring an indictment. He said he wanted to eliminate her. I said, what do you mean? By what we were able to show is that when Alan Masters decided to kill his wife, he simply was able to turn to the two police officers that he'd already been working with on corrupt activities and criminal activities. And that made the homicide and the planning of it and the solicitation of it, it made it an activity of the criminal enterprise. The pieces had finally come together. Investigators put together a likely scenario of Diane Masters' murder. Alan Masters had found a hitman to kill Diane and her boyfriend when they met for the usual drinks after her college board meeting. However, Diane didn't meet with Koselniak that evening. You're home late tonight. The meeting ran late. Furious, Masters took matters into his own hands. Alan Masters was at home babysitting their young daughter. He was setting up his alibi by making long distance calls all night to prove that he was home. He never expected his wife to walk in the door. She did. She began the process of getting undressed and he hit her with a uh, blunt instrument, two uh, blows to the head. Masters then called Chief Corbett, who came with an unknown accomplice to dispose of the body. They dumped Diane's body in the trunk of her Cadillac. Corbett then drove away with the accomplice following him. Masters remained at home with his daughter.
They drove to the remote sanitary canal. Diane's watch was reset to throw investigators off the trail should her body ever be found. They then fired two shots into her head. They wanted it to look like a mob hit. They also reset the dashboard clock to 1.50. Alan Masters made sure that he was on the phone at the time to corroborate his alibi. Corbett and the accomplice dumped the Cadillac into the canal. In June of 1988, six years after Diane's murder, investigators brought charges against the three conspirators. Former police chief Michael Corbett was the first arrested on federal charges of racketeering, bribery, and conspiracy to solicit and cover up the murder of Diane Masters. Special Agent Ivan Harris tried to elicit a confession. Mike Corbett uh, subsequently confessed that he was in fact the person that had put uh, Diane Masters' car in the canal. Uh, he disavowed any knowledge that knowing that she was in the trunk of the car at that time. Cook County Lieutenant James Keating was arrested next on the same federal charges. He too denied involvement in Diane's murder. And finally, Alan Masters. In addition to racketeering and bribery, the indictment against Alan Masters charged that he planned, solicited, and aided and abetted the murder of his wife. Prosecutors would not have enough hard evidence to charge any of the conspirators with the actual murder of Diane. Prosecutor Tom Scorza was able to successfully tie all of their criminal activities together for the jury. Masters was convicted on all counts. Collecting the $100,000 insurance money after having his wife murdered also made him guilty of mail fraud. He received a total of 40 years, effectively, to the end of his life. Former Chief Michael Corbett received 20 years. James Keating was convicted and sentenced to over 30 years. The Masters case was special in my experience because there was no one single piece of evidence proving guilt. What there were were a thousand little pieces that made a mosaic. That was made the case intriguing. It made it very difficult to present. It made it a challenge to present to the jury. But it made a terrific story because in the end, the jury could see how one little plate piece from over here and one little piece from over there made a picture. And the picture was a plot among three fellows who had been involved in a lot of criminal activity to do their ultimate criminal act, murder Diane Masters. Watch yourself. The undercover investigation that Agent Damron oversaw and the work of several other FBI agents exposed a deeply rooted corruption throughout Cook County and brought it to its ultimate demise. By weeding out these pockets of corruption, the people living in the suburbs of Chicago no longer have to live with the lawlessness that threatened to destroy their community.